right, church, let's stand. Let's praise the Lord together.
Amen. He is worthy to be praised. Amen. Pray with me. Father God, we praise you tonight. Lord, we thank you. Lord, that, that, that you use us to accomplish what you want done. Lord, you use us even though we are flawed, even though we are not holy, all those things, Lord. But Lord, you choose us. And Lord, so tonight we just pray that uh, during this time, Lord, you'd open our minds and our hearts to what you have for us, Lord, that uh, we might just serve you better and we would just uh, look to you for all things. Lord, we praise you. You are worthy. You are mighty. You are holy, Lord. We pray all this in the precious, powerful, mighty name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. If you uh, have a Bible tonight, let me encourage you to open to 2 Kings. 2 Kings, find chapter 1. Pastor Wayne, come here for just a second. I saw him up here, and uh, he's going to be our model tonight. Uh He is sporting one of our new Highland Park Baptist Church zipper sweatshirts. Where's Brittany? She loves when I do this because she's in charge of ordering them. But uh, this, too, can be yours. I don't know what it costs. I don't know. Here's all I ask. Before you get ready to cuss, turn that around backwards so they don't know where you go to church. Thank you, Wayne. That looks great, man. Um, Hey, a few things while you're finding, and we'll be in chapter 1 of 2 Kings. Um, I may have said that already. Uh, a, a, a few things um, as you are, uh, if you walk out tonight out in the lobby area right there before you go down the children's hallway, the mallway, you'll see a, a, a big pallet out there full of different types of food. And uh, that, is, that is one of the pallets that we receive weekly to help us uh, fulfill our, um, our blessings in a backpack. And uh, this is a ministry that, 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 I don't know, we started probably 13 years ago, something like that. We had it going in Little Rock, and so we were able to kind of bring that here. And many other churches have joined since that time. We started off with just a, just a few, and, uh, and now we do roughly 500 a week. Uh, as a church, we spend approximately $80,000 a year in our Blessings in a Backpack ministry. Um, And so, um, Food for Souls, they just renamed it recently, Food for Souls. But um, we budget some of that, and then most of that, though, is just through designated giving. People that feel led by the Lord to sow into that ministry over and above their normal giving. Now, here's here's what we're we're going to do. We're going to make sure that that's met. We're going to make sure that these kids each weekend, they, they have a backpack that is full of food, that they can kind of make sure and take care of themselves with that. And uh, it's clearly following the model that we do in our missions, earning the right to be heard. And we have seen entire families come to Christ as a result of us meeting that physical need. So in turn, we might tell of the greater, which is spiritual. Uh, but again, we, we call it a bridge event. Uh, Building a bridge so that one day maybe we'll have the opportunity to share with them the greatest news the world has ever known. So the reason why that pallet is out there is we just kind of want you guys to see. And we also want to challenge you, if you're not giving to this ministry, if you can, please do that. Uh, Some of you guys, your, your, your coffee addiction, if you would just cut your coffee addiction by one cup a day, that would make a powerful difference in the life of these kids. But uh, these envelopes are out there, Food for Souls, and uh, I think they're out there. Bill said he has them out there on the pallet, so you can pull one of those off. And it gives you some different options, Uh, you know, $20 a month, a one-time gift, $200 per school year. This will provide food for one child for each weekend of the school year. Um, So $80,000 a year that we do in this ministry earning the right to be heard. And then uh, as well tonight, uh, all around campus, you will see invite cards for our Easter services uh, the, the very last Sunday of March. So we're just a few weeks away is Easter Sunday. And so, um, you know, go by, pick one of these up, hand it out to your friends, coworkers, people. The goal is people who are not involved in a church somewhere. 
Or maybe a, a better way I should say it is this way. The goal is to invite someone that is not involved in a gospel preaching church somewhere. Um, and so, you know, maybe you have your own business or you can place them out at work, whatever the case is. There'll be three services that morning. Every year we call it the, uh, the first one, we call it the uh, Easter miracle at Highland Park. It is only an hour long service, eight to nine. So we have one at eight, one at nine and one at 1030. The reality is probably this year will be the last year we can only do three. We'll have to do four. Um, and so um, those are exciting things. Uh, there'll be anywhere from 3,500 to, to probably 4,000 folks that'll join with us on Easter Sunday. And so uh, we're excited about that. So grab up some of these cards, hand them out. You've got a few weeks to do that. Uh, tonight we're going to end a series that we started several months ago because we always we have a lot of different things that happen on Wednesday evenings. And so it's not just me sitting down walking straight through a series. And this is uh, the Hillbilly Prophet for 12 weeks. Tonight will be week number 12. We've been studying the life of this Old Testament prophet, Elijah. And so tonight will be the very last sermon in this series. And I trust that the Lord has used this to challenge you, to bless you, to uh, reveal more of himself to you, and you might understand the very character and the nature of God. And my desire always is that you would fall not in love with a church, not in love with a preacher, but that you would fall in love with the Word of God. The only thing that will transform, right? And so here's where my plans are right now to go next week. Um, to start a new series entitled Pray this way. And we're going to spend roughly 12 weeks looking at the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. The Lord's Prayer, the model prayer. I like to call it the model prayer because I don't know it's the Lord's Prayer. The Lord never says, forgive us for our sins. You know, I'm just, anyway. So 12 weeks. You say, how will we do that in 12 weeks? Well, I don't know. Show up and you'll find out. Um, pray this way. And I'm excited about that as I've been kind of working through that. And let me say one last thing before we dig in. Many of you have been so good and so, uh, so faithful to pray for, uh, for Jennifer as she's been walking through her cancer journey. On Monday, she had another surgery. The, uh, we're, we're hoping and praying it's the very last one. Uh, that's what we're believing. And so it went well. Um, it accomplished, uh, the surgeon said, what they were hoping to accomplish. And so, uh, you know, her body, man, she's just been through so much in the last 18 months and uh, so she is just flat worn out, and it'll take her a while to recover from this. But, uh, but God is good, and he has been faithful, and he continues to be faithful. And some of you are thinking, what are you doing here? Our daughter's at home with her. And, uh, and she prefers her company much more than mine. And, uh, and so um, we got back, I don't know, late, late yesterday afternoon. I had the opportunity to come in and do podcasts and stuff like that. And so uh, the reason why I'm here tonight is I don't see this as a burden. I see this as a blessing. I just love to preach, and I love to gather together with you guys. And so uh, thank you for that. Continue to pray. And again, if you would, in your prayers, just say, Lord, please let this be the last surgery that our pastor's wife will have to endure. And I'll just tell you this, if you don't know it, God has created women in not only a beautiful way, but a, a, an, a, an astonishing way. They are just tough. Tough. If, if that were me, I, I'd be laying in my closet for weeks on end. Um, but ladies, kudos, hats off to you. You are much tougher than we men could ever hope to be. And all God's women said, hey, okay, all right, there you go. There you go. All right, let's pick up with our story tonight. And it's a narrative, as most of our study of Elijah has been. But you know what I always try to do, because I believe the Bible is true when it comes to this. Even as we walk through these narratives, there are great biblical insights that we glean from the life of Elijah that have to deal with you and I today. And so as we walk through this narrative, I've kind of I've broke it up into four bite-sized pieces and I'm going to give you four points, but these points are just, they're going to kind of help us walk through the narrative without stopping. Ho hopefully that'll make sense when we get to it. But this is the story of Elijah's last assignment. God's got one final job for his mountain man, one final job for 
the guy that we're calling the hillbilly prophet, and then he's gonna, and then he's gonna, then he's gonna go home to heaven. Look, look in verse one. Look at how the story begins. Second Kings chapter one, verse one. We'll just kind of make our way through it. Verse one. It begins this way: Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. Now uh, Ahaziah. Now Ahaziah was Ahab's son. Uh, remember Ahab. Ahab. He was married to Jezebel. And we've been talking a great deal about Ahab. Ahab had two sons. Both of them rebelled against the Lord. And so when Ahab died, his oldest son, Ahaziah, ascended to the throne of Israel. Now, even though the last time we were together, we talked about how Jezebel died. And some of you came up and said, would you please, do you have to talk so much about B-L-O-O-D? It was a hard thing for some of you. Um, and, and we're not going to talk about that tonight, okay? We've already dealt with Jezebel and how she bled everywhere. You remember, how, you remember the story, right? You remember the story. And so, we're kind of backtracking a little bit in Scripture. So, so, the story that is happening right now, Jezebel is, is still alive. She's going to live for many more years. And even though she's not seated on the throne... In all reality, she's the effective ruler of Israel. Now, one of Ahab's sons, we've already mentioned, he sits on the throne, and he's not going to be there very long. Uh, he's only going to be there for two short years, and then he's going to be gone. And, and that, really, it's the story of how he dies that's really going to occupy uh, our attention for this narrative tonight. Now, here's the problem. Ahaziah had fallen through... Uh, the lattice of his upper room in Samaria, and it injured himself. Now, as far as kingly injuries go, this is a real bummer. No king would sit there and say, oh, I'm severely injured because I fell through the lattice work. Matter of fact, you stop and think about it, you know, for a king, if he injured himself on the battlefield, that would have been a Uh, An honorable way to get injured, but to fall off the second story through the lattice work and hit the ground below, that's that's just pretty embarrassing. Um, uh, You know, it's definitely not something you want to publicize. And we don't even know how it happened. Scripture doesn't tell us. Did somebody push him? Did he stumble and fall off the roof? Did, uh, was he drunk? Is that how he felt? We really don't know. But when he hit the ground, evidently he severely injured himself. Nobody could help him. There was nobody in all of Israel that could heal his injuries. So here's what he thought. I need some help from heaven above. You're like, well, that's a natural progression. I need some help from heaven above, only by above he wasn't talking about the Lord God of Israel. He was thinking about somebody else. So that begins our story. So first of all tonight, here's what I want us to look at. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. There was a desire to know the future. A desire to know the future. Look in verse 2 where we left off. So he, Ahaziah, he sent messengers and said to them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this injury. Now the name Beelzebub only appears one time in the Old Testament and it's right here. You're like, well, that sounds familiar. Well, the word Baal, you know that. We've talked about that. Baal refers to the false god that Jezebel had brought into Israel with her. It was the pagan god of the pagan nation surrounding Israel. They thought he's the god of the sun. He's the god of the storms. He's the god of fertility. So we have Baal, and the rest of the name is exactly the way it sounds. Zabub, Zabub, Zabub. it's just like it's Zabub, kind of the buzzing of flies. The name Baal Zabub means Lord of the Flies. Baal Zabub, it was the particular name for the God of the people who lived in the region of Ekron. Ekron was located on the Mediterranean Sea. It was one of the five major cities of the Philistines, a pagan nation, right? 
When they offered sacrifices to Baal-zebub, the Philistines believed that through those sacrifices, he could predict the future. And to the extent that something happened that they said was going to happen, if it were true, it was kind of the work of the demons that were taking place through this false God. Make no mistake, he was a false God. But that's the reason why Ahaziah was there, and he's like, I want to consult with Beelzebub. I want to know, am I going to get better, or am I going to die from the injuries that I sustained Falling through the lattice work from the second floor of my home. There's only one catch to the story. Israel already had a God. The one true God. The only God. The Lord God of Israel. And so instead of Ahaziah turning to the God of Israel, the scripture says he puts his future in the hands of this false God, this Philistine God, this pagan God, Baal-zebub. Now, I I, want to pause here for just a moment um, and comment that on one level, we can kind of understand Ahaziah's desire. He wanted to know the future. All of us want to know the future. All of us want to know what tomorrow holds, what is going to happen next week and next month. We, we want to know what's going to happen the day after tomorrow, right? What's going to happen next year? Do you know big corporations out there, they spend millions of dollars on consultants who can predict future business trends. If you have a loved one with cancer, you want to know what does the future hold? If you have children, you constantly wonder, and and you would agree, you constantly worry about the decisions that they make, and what will their future hold? At this very moment, I can stand before you, and I can say that I want to know about my own future. At least I think I would. I don't maybe if I found out what it was, I wouldn't want to know it. I, I don't know who knows. Maybe you're here tonight and you're an investor. We have some in the church and you like to know the future when it comes to stocks and bonds and the market and all those kinds of things. That's the reason that some of you guys will watch the guy by the name of Kramer. I'm not talking about Seinfeld Kramer. I'm talking about Kramer on CNBC. He has a show called Mad Money, and he picks all the stocks there. People call in, and if you've ever watched the show, I find it humorous. Not because I have any stocks. I just find it humorous. People will call in, and they'll say to him, boo, yeah. And then he'll respond to them, boo, yeah. And they say something like this, Jim, what do you think about uh, our Amalgamated fruit juice of North Dakota, AFJND. And he punches a button and up will come uh, the recent stock history of AFJND. There's not such a thing, I made it up. And then he begins to shout and he'll start shouting about all the orange crops in North Dakota. And he'll say the orange crops in North Dakota are not really responding the way they should. And he starts talking about why they grow better oranges down in Florida. But in North Dakota, he'll say something like the wheat's looking really good good there but he thinks that the stock is overpriced and here's what he'll say he'll say that one's a dog so you need to sell that puppy am I the only one who's ever said it's very humorous (laughs) he'll press a button and and you'll hear flushing sounds saying flush that stock away don't have that one any longer and then he'll say something like this here's what I want you to do I want you to buy united onions They're the best of them all, the best of the breed. And then he goes on to the next caller, and it's just bang, 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 bang. And I say it's irresistible, it's mesmerizing. I grant you this, he's a great entertainer. Whether he knows anything about the stock market, I have no idea. I've not bought amalgamated fruit juice of North Dakota. Nor do I have any United Onion stock. But people call in and they're like, tell us the future. Tell us. And we all want to know the future just as much as anyone else. It becomes a lot more personal, though, when you're wondering about your own health. A lot more personal when you're wondering about the health of your spouse or the health of your children. You want to know, or okay, are, are my kids going to get married? And if so, 
Who's going to be that lucky soul to get to marry into our family? Are they going to be happy? Are they going to make it? How soon will they bring the grandchildren over? And we wonder and we think about our own career and every, one of, every single one of us has found ourselves saying, Lord, is this what I'm supposed to be doing for the rest of my life? And if it's not this, then Lord, would you please show me somehow what I'm supposed to be doing? I'm just saying, guys, a desire to know the future is, is perfectly understandable. We've all been there. We're all there right now. We all wonder about things like that. Lord, I have my dreams. And Lord, I have my concerns. And Lord, I have things that weigh heavy on my heart. Lord, What's my future look like? Lord, show me the way. And so we all have a desire to know the future. Ahaziah wanted to know the future. But then secondly, we see a defective assistance from the very wrong place. Hear what I'm saying. I I don't criticize Ahaziah for wanting to know if he would recover. That's natural. But he went to the wrong place. And as a result of him going to the wrong place, this would prove to be a fatal, fatal mistake. And that really should not surprise you and I when we read this story because it's almost like we're reading a narrative or a story that would happen today because when people get desperate, they will turn to any source out there that promises to bring them help. What happens is, well, I'm going to call up a friend on the phone, and I'm going to find out what this friend thinks about my future and what may be happening. You know, there are folks out there that will even call psychic hotlines, or they look at their horoscope, or there are folks out there that might even reach out to a medium or what is known as a spiritualist. See, a lot of times you and I, when we think of mediums, we, we think of like people who look like the Wicked Witch and the Wizard of Oz or something like that. But mediums today, for the most part, look just like a normal person. They look just like you and I. Some of you guys have seen the television show from a few years ago. Maybe you watched it on uh, Netflix or something like that. Or maybe you watched it when it was on TV called Crossing Over. A very clean-cut looking young man that was a medium in that show called Crossing Over. Looked like the guy next door. Very pleasant, very nice looking. He was well-dressed. He wasn't overdressed or anything like that. He had a friendly smile. He had a casual demeanor about him. Honestly, he looked like an all-American athlete. He looked like somebody that you wouldn't want to live next door to. And he is there. And he even had a book out praying the rosary. And you're like, well, he's just a good little Catholic boy. And he claimed to be able to to contact your dead relatives. And people would pay huge amounts of money to set up group sessions to where they could go in and they could talk to their dead relatives. And he claimed he received messages from people that he said had passed. And if you've ever watched it, I'm not saying watch it, but if you have, he's really, really good at it. Very good. He talks fast and he makes very quick word decisions and associations. And he claims to get voices and hear those voices and to to get images from what he says is the other side. And he always gets a message from the dead. And usually every message goes like this. We're doing real good. Don't worry about us. And you're doing real good too. We love you. Very, very comforting messages. Calls himself a medium. He claimed to be a spiritist with an uncanny ability to foretell the future. To communicate with the dead. While you and I would sit there and say, that's just crazy. Why would anybody in this world ever do that? I understand Because there's such a desire, I want to know what the future holds. I want to know what's waiting on me tomorrow, what's waiting on me next week. Please understand what I'm saying tonight. The desire to know the future, there is nothing upon nothing that is wrong with that desire. What's wrong is when you try to seek that out in the very wrong place with the wrong individual. 
And people who would go to a medium or people who would read their horoscopes or people who would look to anything along those lines, it's just like they're drinking from a, uh, a polluted fountain and what they get is not going to be from God. What they get will be um, from a demonically inspired person that will destroy their souls. There used to be, I don't think it's still there, I don't know, they... Supposedly, I got a spell cast on me one time because I spoke out against it. But a, a palm reader, someone who could foretell the future, had a little business right there in Lynn Haven. I think it's gone out of business. In which I'm like, well, why didn't you know it was going to go out of business? I mean, it makes no sense to me. Mm. I get why people do this, though. I'm just saying, things have not changed much in 3,000 years. Ahaziah's mistake was not that he wanted to know the future. Ahaziah's mistake is he went to the wrong place. He went to the wrong person to try to find out what the future looked like. So he sends his messengers down to Ekron, right? And there they're going to somehow get in touch with this pagan god, Baal Zebub, and find out if the king will recover from his injuries. So he has help from the wrong place. He has this great desire, like all of us, what is the future going to be? Am I going to get well? Am I going to die? But then third we see, all of a sudden a dispatch comes from God's man. Pick up the story in verse 3 again. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say to them, Is it because there is no God in Israel that you're going to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Notice the word arise there. This is the second time that God has used this word when it comes to Elijah. Arise. Do you remember God? when God told him, I want you to go and I want you to confront Ahab, right? The dead dad, Ahab. I want you to go and confront him over the murder of Naboth. Do you remember? Naboth had a vineyard and it was next to Ahab's summer palace. And he thought, I just got to have this. And he, Anyway, he did what he had to do. Or Jezebel did what she had to do to make sure that he did have that. And so God sends Elijah to confront him. He used that very same word, arise, get up. Elijah, I've got a job for you to do. Wake up, get to work. I want you to go and I want you to ask him a question, just one question. What is the question? Is there no God in Israel? Is there no God Almighty in Israel that you feel like you've got to go down to the pagans and that you should ask this false idol, this pagan God, about the future? Ask him that question. Now comes the bad news for Ahaziah. Look in verse 4. You shall not come down from the bed to which you've gone up, but you shall surely die. Notice the next phrase. So Elijah departed. That's all it says. God gave Elijah a message. And Elijah delivered it. And bam, just like the other times, he's gone. He came out of nowhere. He delivered a a one-point sermon. Uh, He delivered a one-point declaration from God. And then bam, he's out of there disappearing. And evidently, these messengers were so disconcerted by the message that they had received, they don't even go to Ekron. They don't even go and do what the king has asked them to do. Instead, they turn and they go back and they deliver this report to the king. Look in verse 6. They give him this report. A man came to meet us and said to us, Go return to the king who sent you and say to him, Thus says the Lord, It is because... Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore, you shall not come down from the bed to which you've gone up, but you shall surely die. And the king's like, well, that's a negative word. Who who is this man? Who is it that would deliver such a negative message? And I love the answer of these men because they had no idea who they were talking about. Look in verse 8. Listen to how they describe Elijah. A hairy man wearing a leather belt around his waist. And some of your ladies are like, oh my goodness, I'm married to Elijah. I didn't know that. I mean, a hairy man wearing a leather belt around his 
waste. Now, according to L.L. Bean, this is the, exactly what the well-dressed mountain man should be wearing. The hillbilly prophet, a hairy man with a leather belt around his waist. And here's what the king said. I know exactly who that is. I know that guy. I've seen that guy before. I've heard, it's been a while. But I heard him. This is Elijah the Tishbite. Now think about this for just a moment. How did he know Elijah? Why was he able to very quickly discern that it was him? Because Elijah had dealt with his his dad, Ahab. He, He had seen this happen before. Elijah had brought a word from the Lord before. He brought it to his dad. He he, he knew who this guy was. He had heard him and watched him before. Elijah was probably unaware that he had heard him and watched him. But Elijah had made an impression upon him as a young man. You know, I thought about that. And here's the question I ask myself. I wonder how many times that happens to us. Lost people watch us more than we'll ever know. Lost people pay attention to us more than we ever dream. Lost people know more than we think they do. And more than anything else, guys, lost people know whether we know God or not. They're watching us. Why are they watching us? Because they want to see, are we the real deal? And they'll watch us from a distance. We don't even know that they're watching us. Your co-workers are watching you. Your neighbors are watching you. Your lost family members are watching you. They may not say much to you. You may be unaware of it. You may not even hear from them for years and years and years. But the day will come when you will find out that some people were watching you all the time. And they were drawing some conclusions about your faith. They were drawing conclusions about your integrity. Conclusions about your honesty. And they've been drawing conclusions about the reality of your faith when it comes to God. Here's what I believe. I believe God gives lost people an amazing insight into the Christians around them. Here's what, I'm, here's what I mean. It's to say that I believe God's Spirit gives unsaved people the ability to penetrate to the core of who we really are. Now, if you go to lost people and you're like, you know what, I'm going to give you a a doctrinal exam here, right? They would flunk it. But if you were to take lost people and and you were to get a group of Christians before them, I believe believe most lost people wouldn't have any trouble being able to say this about people that they know. He's for real. She's for real. But I tell you what, those two that are in the back, I don't see anything in them at all that's different than me. He knew who Elijah was just because of the message and just because of the description. Unsaved people, they may not understand the doctrine of the Trinity. They may not understand the priesthood of the believer. They may not understand total depravity. The whole concept of the premillennial return of Christ may seem like a mystery to them. But lost people can spot the difference between reality and a fake. They're watching. If you doubt whether that's true, I want to give you an experiment to do. I want you to do this. I want you to go to some of your unsaved friends, and I want you to ask them, what do you see when you look at me? The answer may surprise you. What do you see when you look at me? God's man brings the message. Ahaziah knew exactly who he was. Because he had been watching him. So he said, that was Elijah the Tishbite. And then the king sent to him a captain of 50 with his 50 men. So basically he does this. He sent out a captain that had a company of 50 soldiers, okay? Look in verse 9. 
Then he went up to him, and there he was, Elijah, sitting on the top of a hill. I love the fact, Elijah's just sitting there on top of the hill. Just talking to the Lord, catching a few rays, you know, just, just kind of hanging out up there. This is different than his MO. He's not hiding. It's not a situation where they can't find him. He's just sitting out there, hanging out on the top of the hill, enjoying the open where anybody can see him. And then the captain of the 50, look at what he says. Man of God, the king says, come down. Why do you think the king wants him to come down? Because he's going to arrest him. He's going to throw him in prison. He's going to kill him. He didn't like the message. He saw what the message had delivered. Here's what he knew. I think we miss out on the point that I was trying to make, or maybe I did a poor job of making the point. See, Elijah came. He spoke on behalf of God when it came to Ahaziah's dad, Ahab, and exactly what Elijah spoke on behalf of God happened in the life of his father. Here's what he knew. That man talks on behalf of the true living God. He's close to him. And when he speaks on behalf of the Lord, it happens. The king wants to throw him in jail. Which leads to the fourth point of this narrative. And that is the deadly fire that we see from God. Look in verse 10. Elisha says, if I'm a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. Now I'm sure that's probably the very last thing the captain wanted to hear. And actually, that is the very last thing that the captain and those 50 soldiers heard. Because the next sentence says this, And fire fell from heaven and consumed the captain and his men. Evidently, when the king fell through the lattice work and injured himself, he probably also hit his head because he was not very smart. Because the scripture says he sent another captain with 50 men to capture Elisha. See, if I'd been king, I would think at least send 150, but he sends 50. It's the same song, it's just the second verse. Look in verse 11. Man of God, thus has the king said, come down quickly. And so Elijah answered and he said to them, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Bam, just like that. Fire comes down from heaven and the second captain and the second 50 are annihilated right there. So the king sends out a third captain with his 50. I just assume by this point, these probably aren't volunteers. All right, men, the first group, they burn up. Second group, they burn up. Who would like to volunteer for this mission? <laughs> I don't know. I just think between the lines. Maybe, maybe he had to use a little forceful persuasion there. But I will tell you this. The third captain was a little bit smarter than the first two, and I would say he's probably a whole lot smarter than the king because he didn't want to end up in flames. Look at what it says in verse 13. And the third captain of 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah. And he pleaded with him. And he said to him, man of God, please let my life and the life of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. Look, fire has come down from heaven and burned up the first two captains of 50s. But let my life now be precious in your sight. Verse 15. And the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him. Do not be afraid of him. So Elijah got up. And he went down with the captain to the king. Now earlier, we've already mentioned this, he stood before Ahab the father. Now he stands before Ahaziah the son. Took a certain amount of courage to do that. Because Ahaziah is sick. Ahaziah has already heard the message. He's been told by the prophet, by the man of God, the hillbilly mountain man, that he is going to die. Not only that, but a hundred of his soldiers had been consumed by fire. I would say probably the best and the brightest of his soldiers because you don't send the JV group out on the first run. Probably he's in a foul mood. You think so? I'm sure Elijah's thinking they're going to probably put me to death at any moment. What do you think Elijah did? He was bold. He didn't wait for Ahaziah to say a single word. Look in verse 16. And then he said to him, Thus says the Lord, 
Because you have sent messengers to inquire of Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron, is it because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore, you'll not come down from the bed to which you've gone up, but you shall surely die. I want you to think of the question that he asked. The question that we've now heard four, maybe five times. Let it sink in. Is there no God in Israel? Man, what a question for all of us. Oh, the question tonight for you in your dilemma, in your situation, you're wanting to know the future. You're not sure how things are going to turn out. You're a little anxious, right? Because even though you laid out that 10-year, that 20-year life plan, you had to make some adjustments because there were some things that happened that you didn't have in your plan. Guys, I'm just being honest tonight. My wife and I did not have plans that at the age of 46 she would be diagnosed with cancer. We've all been there. Well, I just want to know what the future holds. I just want to know, is this going to get better? Is it going to get worse? I I, I just want to know. The question tonight for you is not, is there no God in Israel? Maybe the question tonight for you is, is there no God in your town? Maybe it's something like this. Is there no God in your church? Is there no God in your family? Maybe the pressing need is your marriage. Is there no God in your marriage? Is there no God in your life? Is there no God that you can go to in times of trouble? Is there no God? Abraham Lincoln said this. He said, I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming thought that I had nowhere else to go. The late great theologian Elvis Presley said it this way. Oh, where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend to save me in the end. Oh, where could I go but to the Lord? The king did exactly as Elijah said he would do. There are no details because it really doesn't matter. It doesn't tell us how or when. I mean, he's just gone. The only thing that matters is the first part of verse 12. Look at it with me. So Ahaziah died according to the word of the Lord. See, here's what we know. That death is going to come to all of us sooner or later. I mean, we know how this physical existence happens on earth. And some are quick to say, well, that's not true. Jesus could come back before I die. Oh, please, Lord, let it be. Let it be tonight, right? But if he doesn't, we're all going to die. I heard a preacher, he preached a sermon one time, and if he said this one time, he said it a hundred times, hell is hot, life is short. That's pretty deep. Hell is hot, life is short. What is your life? Here's what the Bible says. Your life is like a vapor that appears for just a little while and then your life is gone. Moses prayed this. The psalmist talks about it in Psalm 90. He said, teach us to number our days, O Lord, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Here's what he meant by that. We've only got a certain number of days, every single one of us. And we lay out this plan of life. And some things happen the way we plan. Some things don't happen the way we plan. Some things go worse than we plan. Some things go better than we plan. But we all only have a certain amount of days and then we will physically die who can trace the path of the Lord you can't I can't no one can here's what I mean by that isn't it enough to know that you belong to him I mean, isn't that the greatest gift that we could have, that we know that we are in him, that he knows what he is doing? Is there no God 
in your life? Is there no God in your home? Is there, have you gone outside to try to find help when it comes to the future from some other resource, from some other individual? Because there is no living God in your place. He knows what he's doing. He knows where we are. And when it's all over, we will be with him if we are in Christ exactly where he wants us to be forever in heaven. Is that not enough? So here's, here, here's how I'm going to close this. What's going to happen today or tomorrow? Are you ready? You might want to write this down. What's going to happen today or tomorrow? I don't know. Neither do you. What's going to happen next week? I, I don't know. Next month, I don't know. What, 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 what's going to happen next year? What's going to happen? What's going to happen 10 years from now? I mean, I don't know. But I do know someone who does. And hear me. My hope is not in what will happen. My hope is in the one who knows what will happen. Because no matter what happens, if my hope is in him, it's all going to be all right. Is there no God in Israel? Here's the answer. Yes, there is. And because of Jesus, he's my God too. I don't know what the future holds. But I know who holds the future. And we can trust in him. So church, hear me. Please hear me. I don't want to make light of your struggle. I don't want to make light of the concerns that you have. The worries that you may struggle with. Just as you don't want to do with mine. But I do want to ask the question, what, what, what are you so worried about? It, it, is there no God in Israel? What, no, why, why is it that you lay awake at night? It, is there no God in your family, in your house? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. I want to ask our praise band if they'd go ahead and come right now as we get ready for this invitation. There is a God who is alive and well. And he's never turned a deaf ear to you nor a blind eye. He's in tomorrow before we ever think about it. And just as we have trusted him with our soul, we can trust him with our today and our tomorrow. He wants to bless you and not harm you. He's got a great plan, but he wants your trust and your faith to be in him, not yourself, but in him. Lord God, tonight, I thank you for these powerful words that we see in the life of Elijah but God, thank you for what you've reminded us of tonight. You are God. You're still alive. You're still on the move. You're still speaking. You still hold the future in your hand. So help us to be people of trust. Help us to be people of faith. Those who may not know eventually where the path will go, but those who are content to trust you step by step by step day by day moment by moment our trust is in you O living god of israel